This is LWT, now mystery and intrigue surrounding the Lord Lucan case. It's the most enduring and intriguing murder mystery of the 20th century. With a cast of principal characters straight out of an Agatha Christie novel. What really happened on the night of November 7th, 1974? Never before this program marking the 25th anniversary have so many key witnesses agreed to give their evidence. However, the most important one will not be making an appearance. He is Richard John Bingham, the 7th Earl of Lucan. A new witness speaks publicly for the first time. Was she the woman who saw too much? What I had seen the night before, I hadn't actually seen. I would be grateful if I didn't discuss it with anyone. The multi-millionaire friend suspected of spiriting Lucan away. What made him drive a man to his death? Basically, he cracked up and committed suicide, cursing ghostments from beyond the grave. And could the chance discovery of an address book be a clue to the missing Earl's whereabouts? Under L, he came across Lord Lucan, care of the Hotel Ambassadors, Mozambique. Uh, has he been here? Yes. To whom did Sherlock Holmes refer as a Napoleon of crime? Moriarty. Correct. For what is the town of Limoges particularly famous? It's Southwestland. Correct. Which king of England was called Harefoot? On Thursday, the 7th of November, 1974, at about 8.50pm in the evening, Lady Lucan was in her bedroom watching television with her daughter, Lady Frances. The two youngest children, Lady Camilla and Lord George, gone to bed. the evidence points to the fact that the intended victim on that fateful night was to have been Lady Lucan. But in fact, it was Sandra Rivet, the nanny, who went down to the basement stairs and as she got to the bottom, so she was viciously attacked and murdered. The cause of death, of course, was the, the terrible um, wounds inflicted to Sandra Rivet's head. It wasn't until some time later that Lady Veronica, realising that the nanny hadn't come back upstairs, went down to the basement. Sandra! 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 Ah! 
Lord Lucan is a big man. Veronica Lucan is a tiny woman. But she fought and fought and fought. She could feel her strength disappearing and by a magnificent last effort, she grabbed her husband by his testicles and squeezed as hard as she could until he let go. And they then sat on the stairs together and he told her that he'd murdered the girl. So she said, well, I'm sure we can sort this out together. Let's clean me up. And so they went upstairs. Lord Lucan then went into the ensuite bathroom to get towels to, to stem the blood that was coming out of his wife's head. Veronica! She, realising where he was, ran down the stairs, turned sharp left, and 100 yards down the road, she went into the Thomas Arms public house and raised the alarm. Luca must have realised the game's up. I've killed the wrong person. The person I intended to kill has now escaped my clutches and she's going to raise the alarm. I really must get away. There is no doubt in former Chief Inspector David Gehring's mind that it was Lucan who murdered Sandra Rivett that night at 46 Lower Belgrave Street. But for him, and the late Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Ranson on the left, who headed the inquiry, this was to be anything but an open and shut case. There are many theories about the events that night, and there are even those who argue Lucan is innocent. Lord Lucan, born Richard John Bingham, was a thoroughbred English aristocrat. He was the great-great-grandson of the man who ordered the disastrous charge of the Light Brigade. Sent to Eton in 1947, he was an undistinguished pupil, but it was in such privileged company that he was to meet those who would become his most loyal friends in adult life. The dashing young aristocrat known as Lord Bingham until his father's death wasn't interested in becoming a pillar of the establishment. He was more attracted to a glamorous playboy high life of bobsleigh runs and powerboat racing. There's a mishap hereabouts. Lord Bingham's white migrant had to make an undignified exit and eventually sank. Fortunately, Despite the occasional mishap, his friends nicknamed him Lucky, a name he hoped would be appropriate for his chosen career as a professional gambler. Among Lucan's close friends was old Etonian Charles Benson. Lucky was, I suppose, an addicted gambler because he, hadn't, he never had a profession, he never had a job. He worked in the city very briefly, but it didn't really work. Backgammon was the main preoccupation, and these in the afternoon or early evening, and then he would play the tables. He liked cards, he played bridge as well. In November 1963, Lucan married Veronica Duncan, the daughter of an army major. We were surprised at his choice, but we thought probably it was a case of um, his feeling sorry for her because she seemed a rather pathetic little person to us. I think she didn't have a lot of time for our sort of way of life, which is understandable. It was probably outside her knowledge. But that was, that's the way of it. When you in-laws, it's a bit of a um, dodgy business. You never know who you're going to get as an in-law. In October 1964, Veronica gave birth to baby Francis. Three years later, she had George, and finally sister Camilla in 1970. Lucan was a doting father, but a less than ideal husband. At one time, Lucky had a Doberman Pink Pincher dog, um, and um, he absolutely loved this dog, because Lucky loved Germans, and he loved fascism, and. Uh, and Hitler and things, <laughs> and this dog was his sort of fantasy into into that world. And the, the dog 
slept on the bed and Lucky actually liked the dog farting and um, he thought that was terribly good and masculine and Veronica did not and this is one of the reasons for their disagreement and I have every sympathy with her on this one. And eventually the dog was uh, had to be got got rid of. We used to arrive at the time at about 12 noon. We'd all have a few cocktails together. We'd discuss the racing. We'd have a very good lunch. And then he'd probably gamble at backgammon most of the afternoon. Then he would leave, I suppose, in the evening, early evening, probably go back, have a shower, maybe a half an hour's sleep or a bit longer. And then he came back in the evenings for a longish session until well into the morning, which I don't think would probably suit anybody. Also, he became, I fear, less and less successful, which is always one of these things that drags people apart. Among Lucan's friends was Susan Maxwell Scott, the wife of fellow gambler Ian, who has since died. Veronica would sort of sit there looking tense while John was gambling. She wouldn't even watch sort of over his shoulder to see how he was doing. She would sort of sit like, uh, I don't know, worried, wallflowerish, not speaking to anybody. As far as Lucan's friends were concerned, Veronica Lucan was not a nice person. He told so many lies about her to his friends that they all believed that she was not a good mother and that she was mad. By January 1973, the strain was too much. Lucan left Veronica in the family home and moved into a flat nearby. He tried to get custody of the children through the courts by claiming Veronica was mentally unstable. He loved his children really more than anything else. He had been convinced that he was going to, to win custody because he reckoned he had enough grounds for the children to be given to him. And he lost it and was completely devastated. There's no other word for it. I think it was mainly because of the lifestyle that he led, which led the judgments against him. Because I suppose if you say that you're a gambler and you, you don't get home before four o'clock in the morning and you're out most of the afternoon and, and you, know, you get up very late in the morning, maybe that gives the impression that you are perhaps not a very um, dutiful and respectable father. But it's not the case. He would have been absolutely superb as a father. He was drinking much heavier after the court judgment. He definitely drank more heavily, which was a lot of drink. He was pretty drunk most days, and sometimes worse than others. Dear Lord Lucan, The pressure on Lucan was intensified by demands from his banks. He'd gambled away his fortune, and was more than £60,000 in debt, and making plans to sell off the family silver. Obviously, though, I cannot undertake to continue to meet substantial drawings, particularly as these checks were all in favour of cash or clubs and have, I surmise, all gone in one particular direction. On the night before the murder, Lucan had a drink at his gambling club, the Claremont. He was joined by Colin Ingleby Mackenzie, who was with his wife. And he, I think, had probably consumed just the odd cocktail, maybe six or seven vodka martinis. We both noticed that he was, I would think, anxious. He looked strained. He looked as if there was something on his mind. He had obviously planned something for, for the tomorrow. After the murder, Lucan dealt with unfinished business, which would build the foundation of his defence. But in this programme, there's a new witness, speaking out for the first time, whom he didn't reckon on. It suddenly dawned on me that possibly I'd come across something that I shouldn't have come across. Following the murder of Nanny Sandra Rivet, Lord Lucan had fled into the night in a Ford Corsair he'd borrowed from a friend a fortnight earlier. At around 10.45pm, he called his mother, the Dowager Countess Caitlin Lucan, from a private phone. Police do not know where this was. Lucan did phone his mother. He told her something terrible had happened at La Belgrave Street, um, that the nanny had been injured, and that would she look after the children? During this call, Lucan first outlined his version of events. 
I was driving past the house, Mother. I saw a fight. Uh, Veronica and a man. I, I went down to the basement. There was something terrible there. I couldn't bring myself to look. You've got to get the children. No, I, I don't know where I'm going. He wasn't seen again until he turned up a couple of hours later at the home of Susan Maxwell Scott in Upfield. Susan's husband, Ian, was in London and she was home alone when Lucan called. He looked um, slightly strange, you know, not totally comfortable. And anyway, it was rather odd for him to come down, very odd for him to come down at that time. Of day. Um, so I said, well, what's happened? He'd been walking past his house and he'd seen a man struggling with Veronica, a large man. Uh, anyway, he went downstairs to rescue her, where he slipped on a pool of blood. But he was shouting as he came down the stairs, not unnaturally, he was going, Veronica, Veronica. And uh, as he appeared on the stairs, this man disappeared into the back somewhere. Veronica was semi-unconscious and bleeding heavily. And when she looked at him and saw him, she said, you, you hired that man to kill me. And she then said, he's killed Sandra and pointed at this sack in the corner of the basement. Um, he just assumed that it did contain the body. Uh, but then he, he calmed her down a bit and took her upstairs to their bedroom. But while he was um, soaking the towels, she got off the bed and rushed downstairs and out of the front door, uh, screaming, murder, murder. At Susan Maxwell Scott's, Lucan called his mother a second time. Mother, have you got the children? Good. That's all right, then. No, I don't want to speak to the police right now. I'll ring them tomorrow morning. That night, Lucan wrote letters to a friend from whom he had borrowed the car and his brother-in-law, Bill Shand Kidd. In them, he expressed concern for his children and mentioned lying doggo or lying low. The circumstantial evidence against me is strong in that V will say it was all my doing. I will lie doggo for a bit, but I'm only concerned for the children. If you can manage it, I want them to live with you. V has demonstrated her hatred of me in the past and would do anything to see me accused. For George and Francis to go through life knowing their father had stood in the dock for attempted murder would be too much. When they're old enough to understand, explain to them the disease of paranoia and look after them. Yours ever, John. The letter was posted in Uckfield and arrived with Bill Shand Kidd the following Saturday. I took it straight round to Superintendent Ransom at Joel Road where he opened it and read it. In the letter it expressed the view that um, should anything happen to him, he wanted us to um, bring up the children, which we did and were very pleased to do. He was able to do this eight years later at the children's request. Lucan's letters aroused Ranson and Goering's suspicions because Susan Maxwell Scott had been trained as a barrister. It almost appeared that she dictated the letters whilst he wrote them and that they were going to form part of an alibi when Lucan was finally caught. No way. Uh, I mean, I, n I never saw the letters. I wouldn't dream of dictating the letters um, to John and he certainly didn't ask me to. And <laughs> There's no way I could or would. Uh, the only way I helped with those letters is that he asked me how to spell doggo, which I did tell him how to spell doggo, so I am responsible for that. Susan Maxwell Scott says Lucan left her home, Grants Hill House, at about 1am on the night of the murder. Where he went next is pure speculation. 
he didn't, of course, get in touch and tell me how things went. And uh, I've neither heard from nor, of course, seen him since. The Maxwell Scott's babysitter at Grants Hill House in 1974 was Mandy Parks. She remembers events after the murder quite differently and has not spoken publicly about them before. She believes she saw Lucan at the house 17 hours after he was supposed to have left. I babysat for Susan Maxwell Scott on the 8th of November, which I understand is the day after the murder. And I remember seeing luggage on either side of the porch, maybe six to ten bags, all matching, which was something I wouldn't have come across on a regular basis. This is Susan Maxwell Scott. On that occasion, showed me into the drawing room and I was introduced or said good evening to a number of people that were sitting in that room at that time. One of the main characters in the room was a gentleman that was standing at the fireplace, and I recollect him because he was quite tall with dark hair um, and had a very predominant moustache. Mandy Parks says she later recognised the man that Friday night as Lord Lucan. I was invariably given a letter by Susan Maxwell Scott to state when I was coming back babysitting again. On this particular evening, it partly stated that what I had seen the night before, I hadn't actually seen. I would be grateful if I didn't discuss it with anyone. Um, on reading that, I just showed it to, to my parents, and my father then made the decision to get rid of the letter. Um, People might think it's very strange that I haven't spoken to anyone, but I was then leaving school, going on, doing other things. I, I've said already that I tried to persuade him to stay the night, but he wouldn't. And I've never seen him since, and he certainly was not there the next day. I was quite insignificant, so obviously Susan Maxwell Scott had, had cleared it with them that, that I wouldn't say a word. Regardless of Lucan's whereabouts that evening, the Ford Corsair was spotted abandoned in New Haven, Sussex, on the morning after the murder. Inside were bloodstains of both type A and B, matching those of Veronica and Sandra, respectively. There was also a notepad with a page torn out, matching the letter Lucan had sent to the friend who lent him the car. In the boot was a length of lead piping wrapped in elastoplast. It was similar to the murder weapon which had been left at Lower Belgrave Street. However, it was not identical. It hadn't come from the same piece of lead piping. It didn't seem to have the same plast on it. And one wonders who, in their right mind, would take two murder weapons. Why on earth would an intelligent man choose lead piping? This has not been used since the invention of Cluedo. If you're in the middle of a murder and you lose the weapon, you can't rush out to your car and get another one. It's a ridiculous suggestion. Why was it there? How did it get there? Um, a lot of theories have been banded around. I don't know how it got there, but I think it's a very peculiar piece of evidence. David Gering found the location of the car a confusing piece of evidence. The media in general of the opinion, because the car was found at New Haven, he jumped onto a ferry and disappeared abroad. When I went to New Haven, the car was on the wrong side of the river. The ferry port is on the other side of the river. So it's quite obvious to me that whoever put the car at New Haven had dumped it. And so the theory then began to realize itself in my mind. The car had been taken to New Haven, but Luca had disappeared the other way. Another suggestion is that Lucan committed suicide by jumping into the sea, but his body was never discovered. The sea nearly always gives up its dead, according to Coast Guard Rod Johnson. I've dealt with cases where people have uh, been unfortunate enough to fall into the sea um, between Wales and Ireland, and some days later, you know, a body's come a distance of 60, 80 miles and been found ashore. So if you were determined to, um, to end your life in the sea and you wanted to make sure that your body would not float, it would take quite an amount of weight to tie yourself down. And anybody that's familiar with sport diving will know that divers' weight belts, to enable them to swim freely underwater, have to be extremely heavy. We're talking in the order of uh, anywhere between 35 to as much as 50 kilos, depending on the diver. Um, 
Now that's quite a lot of weight to carry around. Uh, and that's the kind of weight that you'd have to strap yourself to ensure that you would sink. And if that weight were to become detached from your remains during the process of decomposition, then it would all bob up. I don't believe that uh, he ever committed suicide. We had a 50 bob sweep as to what time Luke would appear the following morning. Then everyone thought, well, about nine o'clock, half past nine. But of course, uh, he didn't turn up. I think he's alive and he's started a new life now. What makes you feel that so strongly? The man's a gambler, his background. Everything about the man would suggest that he would start a new life and give up an old life. In the south of England, there's so many inlets, uh, such as Chichester Harbour, uh, Shoreham Harbour, that are not really policed by a customs and excise. And it would have been very easy later, after the murder, for Lucan to have got out of this country in a small boat across the channel. And from there, you don't have to cross any more seas. You can go right the way round down to South Africa. Police searched in vain for the man whose face was on the front page of every paper. I have this very strong theory that he buried himself where he was going to put her body. His disappearance obviously could be put down to various reasons. Um, one could be suicide, which I discount because I don't think that he was the suicidal sort. He was the optimistic sort. He might have had a gun. He might have had a knife. Or he might have suffocated himself in one way. He might have put a bag over his head and descended down into this hell hole that he had discovered. I never thought that my brother would attack Veronica for obvious reasons, that he wouldn't have wanted to deprive his children of their mother. Um, okay, they'd had their differences and so on, but he wanted his children to have the best in life, and nobody can say to, that to have your father murder your mother is a good start. Also, he was incredibly ske squeamish. He couldn't, he couldn't kill a pigeon. We had an injured pigeon at home once, and he was unable to knock it on the head and put it out of its misery. He was always sickened by the sight of blood, so to, to murder somebody and to do it by that method would be absolutely anathema to him. Far more likely is that, that Sandra was the intended victim and that Veronica perhaps surprised the murderer. That very day he had visited a chemist where Lady Luke and acquired her pills, hoping to identify them in order to prove to a, a reopened uh, custody case that she was unsuitable to look after the children. This is scarcely the act of a man who was planning to murder his wife later that evening. He knew Veronica came down every night at nine o'clock before the news, BBC News, to make a cup of tea. And he had checked with his eldest daughter, Frances, uh, that morning, Thursday. So I think he often took the children to school, even when they were split up again. And he had seen her that morning and he said, now, is Nanny out tonight as usual, Thursday night? And daughter said, yes, which was true. What happened was, Paul Sandra's boyfriend couldn't make the date, so she cancelled her night out. So he'd done his homework, but hadn't legislated for the little things. You cannot credit the idea that somebody wouldn't realise that it was not their wife that they were hitting. It's a ludicrous idea. OK, they may have been the same height, but they were quite different. Sandra was quite a, a normally plump girl. My sister-in-law, Veronica, was exceedingly thin, tiny little person, and they had different colour hair. <laughs> if you could see enough to hit somebody, you could see enough to know that they were not your wife. Why, if John was really intent upon murdering his wife, why didn't he finish her off at that stage, instead of which 
he took her upstairs in order to look at her wounds, try and do what he could for her. Having killed one, if you think it was him by mistake, then he must kill the other one. Coming up, the man who vanished into thin air, did his friends cover for him? There was complete silence. It was almost sort of mafia-like. And an intriguing clue in the address book of a friend who took the secret to his grave. Lord Lucan had been quick to vanish into the night following the tragedy at Lower Belgrave Street. But it wasn't long before news of the murder reached his Mayfair gambling club, the Claremont. It was here that Lucan's closest friends were regulars. Among them was the club's owner, John Aspinall. This is the great room, or the saloon, as they called it in the 18th century. Remarkable room, built in extravagant design. All the panels on the ceiling were painted by William Kent himself and are uh, the love life of the gods of ancient Greece. I got up a horse in Leicestershire where I'd been fox hunting, came through in my hunting boots, hoping to cut a dash as I walked through the front door of the Claremont and look rather dashing. Unfortunately, I didn't because there was nobody to witness it. There wasn't a soul there. The Claremont set was such a tight group that every single member seemed to have known me. The word was, stay away, and they did. There was this real feeling of, of close shop, you know. <coughs> there was a complete silence. It was almost sort of mafia-like, black hand. Let's say they, they were difficult to interview. Um, unlike the run-of-the-mill witnesses, uh, a lot of them were of the aristocracy. A lot of them, privately, I believe, felt, well, what, what, what's the problem? It's just so he'd murdered somebody. Is that a problem? And it's a strange thing, you see, with the people like that. On the day after the murder, there was a hastily arranged meeting between six members of the Claremont set, including Aspinall, Bill Shan Kidd, an artist friend, Dominic Elways, and Charles Benson. We had lunch the next day to decide what we'd do when, if we found him, if he appeared. And there were a variety of suggestions. Dominic Elways said he must be put on a banana boat to Brazil, which was shouted down as being hysterical. John Aspinall said he should fall on his sword, because John is a, a great student of Roman and Greek history and took the view, which I slightly agree with, that... Uh, he had screwed up his and his family's and other people's lives so much that there was nothing left for him. But basically none of us really knew anything and uh, it was all hypothesis and uh, we were just doing our best like any group of friends. For Gehring and Ranson, working under the spotlight of the world's media, there wasn't the vaguest hint of Lucan's whereabouts. Police's behaviour and all of this was quite ludicrous. They rang up John Aspinall on Friday evening and said, do you mind if we send some people around to you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to inspect your tiger cages because we think Lucky might be hiding there. So that's pretty good detective work, isn't it, really? I mean, really, no one would have ever, ever uh, worked that one out. Throughout the case, David Gehring had been unhappy with Susan Maxwell Scott's role. She did not alert police about Lucan's visit to her home on the Thursday night of the murder. It was only after Bill Shan Kidd gave police the letter with the Uckfield postmark the following Saturday that they realised she was connected. Susan says she didn't realise the situation was so serious, even when she told her husband Ian the next day. I told him the story of John's visit, naturally, which he said, oh, nonsense, you know. Quite impossible. Well, John must have been drunk or something. He, uh, nothing like that could possibly be real. Um, um, so we just forgot about it. There was nothing in the morning papers on Friday. We don't take, I gather, I've been told that there was something in the Evening Standard. We don't take the Evening Standard. We didn't because it didn't get delivered. And uh, we never watch um, the news on television. We occasionally watch sport, but we never bother to watch the news. 
So the first that we actually knew about what had really happened was on Saturday morning, um, when it was in the newspapers. That's what they were like. And she said, oh yes, he was here sweating and blood-stained and drank three large whiskies and wrote four farewell letters, but I didn't think anything on. <laughs> and that really sums up both their characters. She wasn't obstructing the police, she just didn't, uh, you know, she didn't know any better. However unhappy the police were with witnesses, an inquest verdict in June 1975 was that Sandra Rivett had been murdered. Lord Lucan was formally named as the killer, despite not having been there to defend himself. This was followed by a change in the law, and never again could anyone be implicated in such a way at an inquest. In the absence of her husband, Lady Lucan's evidence that he had attacked her had been the key. Of all the people in Great Britain who uh, would have powerful enough friends to risk him out of the country when required, it, it would be John Lucan. One of the people that we were very interested in interviewing was uh, James Goldsmith, the financier. A year before the murder, Lucan was pictured on holiday in Acapulco with James Goldsmith and Annabel Burley, later to become Mrs. Goldsmith. Jimmy Goldsmith was fantastically rich, and he believed in a certain honour amongst friends, especially friends who had fallen by the wayside. And I've got no doubt in my mind that he had the ability to organise a financial structure for Lucan on the run and where he is now, even though Goldsmith, of course, is now dead. Goldsmith, seen here with Dominic Elways, was determined not to be linked publicly with his friend Lucan in any way. But Elwes painted this picture of the Claremont set, portraying Lucan with Goldsmith. It was published in an article about the background to the murder in the Sunday Times magazine. I didn't say, these people have spirited Lord Lucan out of the country. No, nothing like that. They didn't say, these people are a part of some terrible plot to cover something up. Didn't say that, right? Kelly said, these are the people who have blood to the Claremont every day. But Goldsmith was enraged by being linked with Lucan and ordered that Elwes should be sentenced to social death. He was ostracized by the Claremont set and banned from their club. He idolized Goldsmith and Aspinall and the whole set up there. Um, he was fairly unstable anyway. But basically he cracked up and committed suicide cursing Goldsmith from beyond the grave. He left a terrible suicide note, cursing Goldsmith. We ran an article in Private Eye called All's Well That Ends Elvis, describing what had happened basically to Elvis, linking his persecution and suicide, which was in a way a sort of murder really, to Goldsmith, because Goldsmith was the one who'd given the orders that uh, he was to be banned. Goldsmith's response was to sue Ingrams for criminal libel. Private Eye was almost forced to close down before Goldsmith eventually settled out of court. So any time this case was mentioned in the publicity, there was Goldsmith being linked with Lucan. I mean, it's the old case of, of, of when somebody sues. All you do is to draw attention to the libel, and his name is irrevocably linked with Lucan. Nothing he can do about it. But any definitive proof that Goldsmith helped Lucan lie doggo remains elusive. Goldsmith was adamant that he had nothing at all to do with the murder or the subsequent disappearance of Lord Lucan. In fact, the only thing I got off of James Goldsmith I took his overcoat from him. The odds-on favourite for Lucan's speculated hiding place seems to be Africa. Certainly some of the senior police officers on the case are all convinced that uh, he was spirited out of the country. In your honour today I will, and then it will detain you time which I seldom ever wear, unless I'm up in front of a friendly beak on a driving charge. Um, even then they swear the book and you say it doesn't do much good. But it, it, the, Africa is full of people who, uh, who are Odetanians, or say people who would be sympathetic to looking after a peer of the realm. 
uh, who was in trouble. They also owned estates which are literally hundreds of miles away from the next estate, uh, where a person could live very well with uh, uh, plenty of servants and a, a, a reasonably decent life. One man who believes he came within a whisker of Lucan in Africa is Daily Mail crime reporter Chester Stern. One of the most um, significant sightings, uh, I think, uh, of uh, Lord Lucan since his disappearance arose from a tragic death in a, in a car crash of one of his friends, a guards officer called David Hardy. He'd been on the, on the fringes of the Lucan gambling circle, it fell on hard times. And in 1980, just before Christmas, um, he staggered out of a pub in Essex and was hit by a car and killed. The first police officer on the scene did what they always do to try and identify the victim, went through his pockets and found uh, a small diary address book. He was just casually thumbing through it, and under L, he came across Lord Lucan, care of the Hotel Ambassadors, Byra, Mozambique. Uh, when I heard of this, we went to see the, the widow of, uh, of Hardy, and she told us that she'd given her husband the address book for his birthday in 1976, two years after Lucan disappeared. So clearly very strange. Why would a friend of Lucan put a foreign address for somebody he knew was dead? Chester headed off to the Hotel Les Ambassador to check out the lead. I went to the bar, and there were two barmen there, and we got chatting, um, and I showed them a photograph of Lord Lucan. Uh, has he been here? Yes, many, many years ago. So I said, well, where did he go to? They said, Hotel Esteril. Where is that? Five miles away on the beach. And uh, I went to find the hotel. And to my astonishment, uh, when I was going through the register in April 1975, uh, that's just six months after the murder of Sandra Rivet, there was an entry for a John and Davina Maxwell Scott, who had stayed in the Hotel Esteril for nine days. Now you remember the Maxwell Scots were Lord Lucan's friends. It was to their house in Uckfield that he went on the night of the murder. Susan Maxwell Scott says she and Ian never went to Africa and there's no John and Davina in her family. For Chester the trail went cold. There have been hundreds more claimed sightings of Lord Lucan all over the world and several missing person appeals, even using aged pictures of him but arguably there's no concrete evidence that any of the sightings are genuine. I'm firmly of the view that if he was going to contact anybody, it would be either me or the children. He has never been in contact with any of us uh, over the 25 years, which slightly leads us to believe that he may be dead. In my view, all these sightings were all complete balderdash. I've never believed any of them, and I will not believe them in the future. People say that if he runs away, he's automatically guilty. And I think that John would have said to himself, who is going to believe me? The job of putting together a believable defense would fall to one of the country's top criminal barristers, such as Jonathan Goldberg, QC. To defend Lord Lucan today, I would want to do everything possible to seek to prove that there was indeed an unknown intruder whom he disturbed in the act of attacking his wife and who must have been responsible for killing the nanny. I'm afraid one would want to investigate closely the background of the nanny. She had many boyfriends and it was possible that one of them was perhaps a jealous lover. Lady Lucan is the vital witness against him. One would want to investigate her troubled mental background, and undoubtedly she had had psychiatric treatment and was under psychiatric medication at the relevant times. One would want to reopen the files of the custody battle in order to explore the bitterness which might underlie her efforts to claim that he was the attacker. The one question you must never ask a defending lawyer is whether or not he believes his client is guilty, because it's our duty to defend a man to the very best of our ability and to fight his corner if he says 
despite all the evidence that in fact he's wrongly accused. But I have assessed carefully the evidence in this case, and let me make an exception and say that I think he did commit the murder, and I think he attempted to kill Lady Lucan as well. The damning piece of evidence for me is the finding of that near-identical cosh bandaged in just the same way to give it a grip in the boot of the Corsair car, which is an identical match for the murder weapon in the house. I think he's been punished enough. Uh, there is such a thing as natural justice, and I hope the poor man, if he is still alive, is left alone. What the years had left him, it must have been miserable. So, poor old thing, what a terrible turn of events. I don't feel any different about him. I'm disappointed that he bungled the thing so badly and he did something so absolutely ludicrously idiotic. But my feelings for Lucky are the same as ever. I miss him very much. His humor and his presence and his generosity um, are things I shall miss the rest of my life. I had this recurring dream, it's very vivid, of myself walking down Knightsbridge from Hyde Park Corner towards the Barclay Hotel on my left, and I suddenly see Lucky walking across the road, the same direction, and I'm terribly excited, pleased to see him, and he's making a face to tell me not to show any open sign of recognition. Um, he's not rebuffing me but he's clearly doesn't want to be seen and I suppose that's just about what I I would think and do. Lady Lucan, now 63, declined to appear in this program, saying she stood by her evidence from the inquest. Certainly six years after the murder, her mood had been forgiving. I've recovered from it. Um, it was just a marital thing. You forgive him? And certainly um, it might have been better for our family had he succeeded in killing me. And provided it, it didn't hurt, which I gather uh, Sandra Rivet was killed with one blow, so she didn't actually feel anything, I wouldn't know. And if it were better for our family that this should have happened, then uh, I sometimes think... Uh, I wouldn't know anything about it. And our family would have continued without all this publicity. Lady Lucan is now estranged from her children. Her son George recently applied to inherit the title, but the Lord Chancellor turned him down, saying there was a reasonable chance his father, who would be 65 this year, is still alive. To this day, he and his sisters believe Lucan to be innocent. What everyone seems to have forgotten is that a young girl, in the best part of her life, was murdered for no other reason than she was mistaken for somebody else. Uh, and yet, very little sympathy has ever gone out to Sandra Rivet. Sandra Rivet was cremated on December 18, 1974, at Croydon Cemetery. She left behind a son three years older than George Bingham. There's no plaque or memorial to remember her by. Sandra Rivet's parents were robbed of their daughter and I imagine would never have got over it. All of us have, have suffered the effects over the years and my brother's children, everybody has suffered. And I think people sometimes forget this.